and the kitchen sink. In 1965, James Bond did it everywhere in Thunderball. It was the peak of Bond mania and remains the highest grossing Bond film domestically when adjusted for inflation. Great difficulty surrounded the rights to the novel due to the lawsuit of Kevin McClory. Producers Cubby Broccoli and Harry Saltzman reached a deal with McClory to make Thunderball as part of Eon's official series. Yet the trouble didn't end there. The film's production was fraught with issues as the team had to deal with the intense scrutiny of a world desperate for more 007 adventures. Goldfinger had swept the world's box office, and the double bill reissue of Dr. No and From Russia With Love became the highest grossing reissue in history to that point. Thunderball had everything in terms of spectacle, Panavision scope photography, a massive budget, and underwater sequences never before attempted on such scale. This led to many issues in the post-production process, which was incredibly hectic. The soundtrack was prepared and released while John Barry was still scoring the second half of the film. Thus, no music from the second half was included on the 1965 soundtrack release and wouldn't surface until a 1992 CD release of bonus tracks as a Thunderball suite. Editor Peter Hunt not only had to work with a great deal more footage than before, but footage from multiple units on both land and underwater. Rumors suggest the rough cut was somewhere near four hours long and required massive trimming. Hunt was forced to ask United Artists for more time to complete the edit as it was deemed impossible to meet the original release date that had been set. UA agreed and pushed the release back to Christmas 1965. This allowed Hunt the chance to finish the film and make some drastic changes to not only the story, but his established revolutionary editing style from the first three Bond films. He favors white transitions throughout Thunderball, and the film has a more leisurely pace, which fits into the feel of both the Bahamas and the underwater sequences. What he focused on most in his cutting seems to have been the second act, which has many deletions, shifts, trims, and things removed. Unfortunately, director Terence Young was unable to be present for the editing, as he had already committed to the puppy as also a flower for the United Nations. This meant his and Hunt's established relationship wasn't allowed to continue during the film's editing process. Many fans complain about the film's pacing and claim the final underwater battle is too long. This and other sequences were expanded after Hunt's initial edit at the request of the producers and others who wanted all of the production value on screen. For example, Hunt recalled his edit of the final underwater battle was somewhere around four minutes, and he was told to put back in as much material as possible, resulting in the theatrical release version, which runs around nine minutes. The film is known among fans for a number of continuity errors, which are mostly editing tweaks to fix shot footage. This presumably is more visible due to the rushed post-production schedule. This is not all that was affected. Over the years, two different audio mixes of Thunderball emerged from the original 1965 release. These were both mixed and released in single-channel mono, even though the film was in scope 235 to 1. The Bond films did not move into stereo officially until The Spy Who Loved Me got a four-track stereo mix in 1977. Rumors and mentions exist of stereo engagements and 70mm blow-ups of previous Bond films, but officially, nothing is known to exist for the first nine films except mono mixes. The two Thunderball mixes have no explanation as to their origin or source, so this is all pure guesswork on my part. The main premiere dates were December 9, 1965, for the Tokyo premiere, December 22, 1965, United States premiere, December 29, 1965, UK premiere. With there being a slight gap between all the various international premieres, it is possible that a second mono mix could have been finished and prepared for the later prints. Changes between international premieres were not uncommon to the Bond films. Goldfinger premiered first in the UK with the 003 bomb timer, which was changed to the classic 007 timer insert shot by the time of the early 1965 USA release prints and all subsequent later prints worldwide. Only a handful of early UK prints and 16mm copies seemingly have the original 003 timer shot. Thunderball was also trimmed to have a shorter runtime in other territories, much as Honor Majesty's Secret Service would be for its theatrical run. This explains why most original 1965 foreign dubs of Thunderball are missing entire sequences as they were not included in that country's original release version. Judging by the handful of print examples I've been able to see or inquire about, my best educated guess as to why there are two mixes and where they came from boils down to this. Mix A was likely the original 1965 mono mix, 
and mix B is very likely a slightly later mono mix with some tweaks of dialogue and music to fix supposed errors and utilize preferred alternate dialogue takes. It may be a case of one mix being a UK mono and the other mono mix being a mono track made for the US and or the international market. For years, Bond fans have noticed differences between varying versions of Thunderball screened in theaters and released on video. The sources used for this comparison are a capture of the 1984 CBS Fox VHS Hi-Fi Mono track for Mix A. This is the best and least manipulated version available at present. For Mix B, there is no official release of the original mono presentation. The 1995 MGM UA Home Video Matrix Stereo Surround Remix used Mix B as its base source and thus contains all the unique differences found only in Mix B. MGM UA went to the original dialogue, music, and effects stems and replaced the score from Stereo Masters. The overall balance and levels are changed, but no new effects are added. While not an identical comparison, it will display the differences between the two theatrical mixes, Mix A and Mix B. However, there is at least one error in the MGM UA home video remix. In the opening gun barrel, Bond's PPK gunshot is cut off in the remix. This does not occur in either original mix, which allows the natural reverb to fade gradually. The error is found in video releases using the MGM UA remix from 1995 onwards, except for the 2006 Ultimate Edition DVD, which used another fully revisionist mix with new sound effects and incorrect music cues made by Mikasa Studios. I was able to confirm the MGM audio remix is based on Mix B by seeing several US 16mm and 35mm print examples over the years, and also by conferring with other fans. Neither Mix A or Mix B have the gun barrel audio error. <laughs> briefly summarize all of the variations I've found over the years, I'll go through comparing both Mix A to Mix B. Examining the two different mixes at this point shows that the line in Mix A seems more obviously dubbed in as it is at a different volume level from the rest of the track, whereas the line in Mix B seems more in keeping with the rest of the levels in the track. It is unknown which was the original line and which was done later. Now you can tell about the one that got away. Sorry, old chap. Better luck next time. The next difference is another line of dialogue, which is only heard in Mix A of the film. It is not present in Mix B. When Bond and Felix Leiter are searching for the lost Vulcan bomber by helicopter, at one point a manta ray is glimpsed, and in Mix A you hear this line, whereas in Mix B the scene plays without a line of dialogue. Oddly enough, it is thought to and claimed to be a line spoken by Earl Cameron, who plays the role of Pinder in the film. Although it doesn't quite sound like his voice to me, and I've even wondered at times if this is somehow a pitch-modulated version of a line spoken by Rick Van Neuter, who played Felix Leiter in the film. Of course, in this scene, it is only Bond and Felix and the helicopter, and no one else is present, which would make it nonsensible to have another voice in the helicopter with them. This seems to have perhaps been a victim of the severe trimming to the second act, and the multiple helicopter trips being condensed down as much as possible. It is feasible that an earlier version of this scene existed with Pinder in the helicopter going along on the search, and this is just a remnant of one of his only lines in a scene that is no longer in the film. Manta Ray! Unusual to see them as far out as this. The 
The next difference occurs when Bond is discovered after learning the hiding location of the bombs underwater. In the ensuing fight, Mix A plays with only sound effects and no music whatsoever. This was changed in Mix B to have a reprise of John Barry's cue labeled Chateau Flight from the opening pre-title sequence. This is very obviously duped in as the quality of the track is noticeably lesser to all the other music in the film and does actually sound like it was hastily copied and placed into this scene to increase the dramatic tension. This feeling of perhaps being copied and added into the scene at the last minute uh, continues to be felt and even the stereo remixes of Mix B because the actual music source is still noticeably lesser from the rest of the film. The next difference occurs at the start of the scene where Largo is menacing Domino to entice her to reveal information about how much Bond knows about their operations. In Mix A, if you listen carefully, it seems to be an entirely different take or audio take of Adolfo Celli. The dialogue itself is actually slightly different from the version found in Mix B. Pay close attention and you'll notice that in Mix A, Largo says what Bond knew presuming that he has indeed killed Bond by leaving him to his watery grave, whereas in Mix B, he has the phrase, what Bond knows, which changes Largo's intention in this scene, because in Mix B, he apparently thinks he's merely stopped Bond for a time and not actually killed him, whereas the take used in Mix A has Largo believing he has killed Bond. The voice speaking the dialogue at this point in Mix A does seem different to the rest of the overall dub performed on Adolfo Chili's performance by Robert Rieti in the finished film. In Mix B, it sounds much closer to Rieti's dub, so it is possible that the voice you are hearing at the start of this scene in Mix A is Adolfo Celli's actual line reading recorded on set or at some other time. Or it is also possible it's just a different take of Rieti reading the line for the dub. The rest of the scene reverts to being the same in both mixes, so it is merely the start of this scene that has the alternate take audio in Mix A. 
You have given me much pleasure, Domino. In return, unless you tell me how much bond you, I'll be forced to cause you great pain. This for heat, these for cold, applied scientifically and slowly. Very, very slowly. Activating the bombs. You said you wanted to be told. Oh, yes. A private little matter, my friend, between the young woman and myself. Go. Do not live in hope, my dear. There is no one to rescue you. You've given me much pleasure, Domino. But in return, unless you tell me how much Bond knows, I'll be forced to cause you great pain. This for heat, these for cold, applied scientifically and slowly, very, very slowly. <gasps> Activating the bombs. You said you wanted to be told. Oh, yes. A private little matter, my friend, between the young woman and myself. Go. Do not live in hope, my dear. There is no one to rescue you. At this point in the underwater battle, there is a noticeable and very jarring uh, series of edits in John Barry's music cues to instigate the more frenzied action of the rest of the battle. Peter Hunt claimed that his original edit of this sequence was around four minutes, and then he had to expand it to the nine minutes or so we have in the finished film after the producers requested that he put back in as much underwater footage as possible. These rather jarring musical edits do lend some credence to that story, as it seems very likely that John Barry had actually scored a different edit of this sequence, and then his score had to be very hastily uh, reconformed to match the new extended edit of the underwater battle. However, in looking at mix A and mix B, at this particular point, they do go out of sync for a period of time, even seeming to have slightly different edits to the musical cue. It is possible that the two mixes were done at a different time, and th at this point, the musical edits to make Barry's cue match the new edit of the battle were done slightly differently to one another. When compared directly, and especially when overlaid on top of one another, you can hear the significant difference in the sync, which is at a certain point completely lost and then regained after about a minute to two minutes of being completely different from one another. <laughs>
next difference is another minor musical difference. At this point, in mix A, the music cue fades out quickly, and then we're left with some sound effects before the shot changes, and we get the next line, way anchor. In mix B, the music cue is not cut off and actually continues under the way anchor line. <laughs> The next difference is also an audio difference that takes place shortly thereafter. In mix A, Largo has a line that is slightly longer and seems like a different audio take than what we hear in mix B, where the line is slightly truncated and a little bit different due to it being a different audio take. As in the previous Largo line differences I discussed, it is possible that mix A is using Adolfo Celli's actual voice recorded on the set or a different take, and mix B is using the Robert Rietti dub. It is also possible that mix A is merely using a different take of Rietti's dub. <laughs> Over. We've got away from them. We've still got one bomb aboard. We've still got one bomb aboard. And then finally, the ending music cue is entirely different in both mixes of the film. As Bond and Domino enter the life raft, we have John Barry's cue composed for this scene, and only in mix A do we hear John Barry's intended Thunderball reprised instrumental for the ending of the film. Thematically, this perfectly concludes the film with an epic flourish as Bond and Domino are picked up by the Skyhook. In mix B, we have a crossfade into the original James Bond theme recording done for Dr. No. While this does give an epic flourish to the end of the film, it is obviously not in keeping with John Barry's score and Similarly to what happened on Goldfinger, where John Barry did compose a specific end title instrumental of Goldfinger, and that film, the end title theme that Barry composed, was replaced by a reprise of the opening title song performed by Shirley Bassey. And so here in Thunderball, in Mix B, we similarly have Barry's ending cue replaced with a reprise of the James Bond theme. Both cues used in both mixes of the film also have to deal with the severely truncated ending credits, which were reputedly cut to remove the original mention of the next film to follow Thunderball in the series, which was to have been Honor Majesty's Secret Service. But as this was a last-minute change, it seems that the actual credits were hastily altered and thus have the very abrupt ending to black, as we see in all versions known to exist of Thunderball. To this date, no version of the original uncut credits has ever been found or is known to exist, sadly.
both mixes were used as part of the original 1965 theatrical release and come from the same source. One is very likely an edit of the other, and it appears that Mix B was made to include some of these minor changes for a more polished mix overall. The differences affect dialogue takes, added music cue placements where there were none, addressed the choppiness of the cue edits in the underwater battle, and reused the original James Bond theme, a particular thing that Peter Hunt did continuously in the 1960s James Bond films, much to John Barry's consternation. The original Dr. No theme was never again used after Peter Hunt left the series following On Her Majesty's Secret Service, which also featured the original James Bond theme making its final appearance in an Eon James Bond film during the attack on Peace Gloria and replaced a John Barry Q composed for the Peace Gloria battle. Keeping those elements in mind after comparing the two mixes leads to the conclusion that Mix B is likely a revision of Mix A and is why it turned up on USA release prints. Furthermore, it is likely that Mix A is or was used in the UK as it was found on all early video releases which used a UK cut print source. Mix B only became the primary mix on video releases after the MGM UA stereo remix in 1995, which was presumably done from US vault elements. Both mixes need proper preservation and should be present on any release of Thunderball in their original mono form. They make for a fascinating comparison. At the time of making this video, only Mix A can be heard in its original form on pre-1995 home video releases and is at present the only way to hear Thunderball as originally mixed and intended. Which mix is contained on vintage release prints and 16mm prints varies, but on all video editions before 1995, Mix A is the audio track found. In 1995, MGM UA Home Video prepared a brand new CAV Deluxe Anniversary Laserdisc box set release to match the previous year's box set for Goldfinger. This included a full CAV rendering of their Letterbox Video Master, new extras, and a brand new custom stereo matrixed surround remix of the film. MGM UA apparently had stem sources for the film, which they didn't for the first three Bonds. This allowed them to place John Barry's score from a stereo source into the mono dialogue and effects stems to create a then-current ProLogic encoded 2.0 surround track. While this is not how the film was ever mixed or designed to be heard, it is otherwise mostly faithful to the original design and has no new effects added. The other main difference is some application of noise reduction heard especially around the dialogue. Yet it is immediately noticeable that many differences in dialogue and music are present in this remix. The reason is that MGM UA used Mix B as their source. Presumably, the master element they had in their USA vault holdings was for Mix B, and so from this point onward, Mix B became the version heard in all editions as part of this remixed audio. In 1998, the 2.0 stereo surround was upgraded to a 5.1 discrete track for the final Laserdisc release of the film, which merely repressed the box set master in a CLV format without the extras. This became the basis of the initial DVDs, including the 2000 Special Edition DVD, which carried the Laserdisc Master with the 5.1 remixed audio and extras. In 2006, the Ultimate Edition DVD of Thunderball used a new master of the film prepared by Lowry Digital and supposedly sourced from a 4K negative scan. Sadly, all of the Ultimate Editions and later Blu-rays featuring these Lowry Digital masters were very poorly done, including an extremely manipulated picture. The Ultimate Edition DVD 5.1 remix of Thunderball was presented in both Dolby Digital and DTS Codex and was a brand new remix by Mikasa Studios. Like their other Bond remixes done at this time, this is an extremely revisionist track that continually adds new effects and changes balance, levels, placement, and overall dynamics. This is a terrible track and thankfully was abandoned for the Blu-ray, which reverted to a version of the MGM UA stereo remix. Unfortunately, Mikasa's appalling remixes still plague the other films they worked on and remain a shameful desecration of the original audio presentations. The reason why their putrid Thunderball remix was likely abandoned is the one reason why it is of any importance. In at least one instance, they somehow obtained an alternate musical cue that is not to be found elsewhere. When Bond meets Domino underwater for the first time, we are treated to an entirely different cue by John Barry without the prevalent usage of the James Bond theme as heard in the main score and film version. Mikasa's blunder here has allowed for fans to hear this alternate cue.
If that were not confusing enough, the track labeled Original Theatrical Mono on the 2006 Ultimate Edition is not that at all. Instead, it seems like a custom new mono mix made from original elements that combines elements of both Mix A and Mix B. This hybrid track has some of the unique elements of each mix, but sadly has been subjected to noise reduction and audio processing, making it of overall lesser quality. Notes on the Blu-ray edition. The Blu-ray edition thankfully seems to roll back many of the Lowry Digital changes and is seemingly a different scan or master of the film. While it has many issues including some occasional damage, in addition to rather deficient color timing, it at least is a far better presentation than the overprocessed Ultimate Edition DVD. The Blu-ray also does away with the horrid Mikasa audio remix. Instead, it features a 5.1 DTS HDMA lossless rendering of the MGM UA stereo remix. Additionally, the remix seems to have been retransferred for this release, as the soundscape is expanded a bit further in the 5.1 configuration and the audio levels seem a bit different. It is still the same bass remix, so the noise reduction on the dialogue, revisionist level balances, and stereo score remain. This track features the gun barrel audio error. The track labeled Original Mono on the Blu-ray is merely a lossy fold-down of this 5.1 presentation. While not historically accurate, this does at least give the viewer a more appropriate presentation of Mix B inside of a mono container. Unfortunately, you can still hear the mixing level differences and stereo score inherent to the remix. For Mix A, unfortunately, in terms of audio fidelity, the best sounding release of the Mix A mono of Thunderball is only found on the 1984 CBS Fox VHS release from the United States. This contains a far superior VHS hi-fi rendering as compared to the earlier CBS Fox VHS release only having a linear audio track. The hi-fi mono found on this tape is the most unmanipulated and untouched transfer of the Mix A mono that I have found on any home video release, including even the Laserdisc releases. Because this is a relatively untouched transfer of the Mix A mono, the overall fidelity is very much what you would expect from a 1965 mono mix, and so it can sound a bit duller in places such as the title song, for those who are used to the MGM home remix in stereo. However, this is the best possible representation of the original Mix A mono that I know to exist. However, it is not without its own particular issue. As most original video copies of Thunderball seem to have used UK print sources, this is missing the mink glove scene between Bond and Patricia Fearing at Shrublands, as this was originally removed by British censors for the 1965 release. So while this is the best presentation of the mix A mono that I know to exist, you will have to source the mink glove scenes audio from a different source, such as the Blu-ray mono fold down of mix B. Mix B is far more complicated, as no official release has the second mix in its original mono form. Since the remix does not change any effects, any addition, whether in 2.0 surround or 5.1 discrete, contains the secondary Mix B theatrical audio, with the caveat being that it is in its original form. The only way to hear this mix in the original mono form is to locate a 16mm or 35mm original print, which has Mix B as its audio. Of the currently available editions, the mono track on the Blu-ray release, that is a fold down of the 5.1 stereo remix, is the closest form to Mix B in its original mono form, but it still features the same noise reduction on the dialogue and the slightly different levels as the score was replaced in stereo into the original mono stems. However, because this is a mono fold down, it does more closely approximate the original mono form of Mix B, and so gives you a good approximation of what the Mix B specific differences play like in a mono form. This has been some of my research into the audio mix differences and history of the audio mixes of Thunderball. As stated before, this is merely my best educated guesswork 
on this issue as no official sources have ever gone into what caused the two different mixes of the film and no official release contains both mix A and mix B in its original mono form. The only official mention of any audio differences for Thunderball is the short documentary produced by John Cork included in the special edition supplements. However, it only highlights certain differences, not all the ones I have mentioned here, and also includes a tantalizing glimpse of some of the undubbed sections of the film. Until a proper search is made of Eon's vaults, and more information is released to the public, or we see a new 4K release of Thunderball that includes new audio mix transfers and restorations of both Mix A and Mix B. Will there be any way to further discuss this issue? Unfortunately, without any official confirmation, all we fans can do is gather our research and make our best educated guesses. This has been my exploration into the audio history and presentation history of Thunderball. And as always, keep bonding, and thank you ever so much for watching. Dr. No, big, from Russia with love. Bigger, Goldfinger, even bigger. Now, here comes the biggest bond of all. Thunderball. Now, James Bond does it. Everywhere. Look up. Look down. Look out. Here comes the biggest bond of all. Albert R. Broccoli and Harry Salzman present Sean Connery in Thunderball. Produced by Kevin McClory. Panavision. Technicolor. A United Artists release. Thunderball.